Bonsoir, Montréal. Je travaille un petit peu mon québécois. Donc, c'est un deep dive into Docker Storage Drivers. Uh, that's usually like a one hour talk, but I ain't, nobody got time for that. So, that will be a not so deep dive into storage drivers. I try to compress that talk a little bit so we can fit into 20 minutes. Uh, okay, so first, uh, who am I? So I'm Jérôme Petazzoni, I'm French, as you guess from the accent. Uh, I have a really funny title on my business cards, uh, not that one, it's that one. Uh, and I do some stuff with containers. Um, okay, so the outline is I will uh, quickly talk about Docker, then I will talk about copy and write, then I will talk about how this applies to Docker, and explain the different storage drivers uh, that we have uh, in Docker. Okay, so first, really quick intro to Docker, and I have some exclusive content for those of you who have already seen a variant of that talk. Um, and I would like to kind of uh, bounce on the talk on technical depth that we had just a few minutes ago. Uh, Docker is born out of technical depth, dun dun dun. Because uh, at some point, uh, when we had dot .cloud, we say, okay, uh, everybody is burning out, uh, stuff is breaking all the time, we need to rewrite the core of our engine because we can't stand it anymore. And the rewrite of that core was Docker. And we started to show that to a few like uh, garage startups in uh, the Bay Area, like Twitter, GitHub, and they say, oh, that's great, we want more of this. So we took more engineers to work on it, and we made a new iteration on this, and the feedback was, oh, this is awesome, we want even more of it. And, and so on, and so on, and so on, until there was almost nobody left to work on .cloud, and everybody was working on Docker. So that's the story of Docker. So what's Docker? It's a platform to build containers and run them and blah, blah, blah. Well, let's cut straight to the chase. Uh, if you've never seen Docker in action, it looks like this. You do like a docker run, dash ti, python bash, for instance. That means, hey, docker, take the python image, create a container out of it, and uh, run that, and give me bash a shell in it. So I have a bash, and I do pip install ipython. So I guess you all know about pip, but that's the python uh, package manager. And I tell it, hey, install ipython, that we just heard about, how convenient. And so this will run uh, pip to in download and install ipython, and, just, and then I have ipython, and can do stuff in it. Great. So this is what happened. I got a new container, a new file system, which is a copy of this Python image. I have my own network stack with an IP address, my own process space, and everything and everything. But what did not happen is that we did not make a full copy of the Python image. We did not take that 100, 200, 300 megs image and copy it entirely to run uh, pip and then IPython in it. Um, so we used a mechanism called copy and write. And copy and write is important because that's what makes Docker really cool. That's what makes us quick demo of, look, Docker run Python. Boom, you have a Python container. Instead of Docker run Python, oh, wait, I'm doing apt get install, debootstrap, copy, whatever, and it takes an hour until I can finally do some stuff in my container. Huge uh, disk space savings, because if I run that 10 times, I just end up using a few megs of disk space instead of a few hundred megs or a few gigs of disk space, and huge time savings, because each container starts in a few fractions of second. So short intro to copy and write. Uh, I'm not a computer historian, so if you want a real deep intro to copy and write, look it up, Google, Wikipedia, everything. But I want to talk about copy and write for memory. Um, if you know some stuff about Unix systems, in Unix systems, the only way to create a new process is to use fork. So when, when you're on your shell, you type ls, you're not exactly starting the ls process. You have your shell, your shell is making a copy of itself. I'm not going to step away because the cameraman is going to kill me otherwise. <laughs> so you're not exactly starting ls. You're making a copy of the shell, and the copy of the shell will use exec to replace itself with ls. So I have uh, the parent process is still bash, it's still looking on this other child process until it transforms itself into ls and then it waits until it's done. And so um, at that point we are not making a full copy of the bash process because that would be kind of useless since we're going to replace it anyway with ls in just a fraction of a second, but we're using copy and write. So copy and write is a kind of magical mechanism using a little uh, piece of hardware called the MMU, the Memory Management Unit. And the idea is as if you are going to a library and you say, hey, I want that book about things. 
and uh, I want to be able to make notes on it, like scribble with my pen and everything. We go, okay, this is the book. It's not exactly the book. It's a kind of magic book where each page is a kind of shadow ghost copy of the actual page. Uh, so it's instant to make. And when you get your pen and you're ready to write on it at the very moment where your pen is about to strike the page, boom, the book is replaced by an actual uh, page, an actual paper page, and you can write on it. And it's your own private copy of this page. That's exactly what happened with copy and write in a computer. When you make copy and write, you get pages of memory. Yeah, they're actually called like that. Uh, it's a bunch of uh, four kilobytes of memory on most computers. And they are actually references to the physical page. They are read-only. And when you try to write on it, there is something called a page fault. It's like the MMU says, hey, you don't have write access to that page, so stop. I'm going to tell the kernel, the big boss here on the computer, that you did something wrong. And the kernel is like, OK, you did a write on something, and you didn't have the permission to do it, so what shall I do? If you try to write on a location that doesn't exist, you get something that, uh, who has done C code here? Some people, who on those people, you already had sec faults, right? If you don't, then you're a liar. Um, but uh, sec faults are when you try to write or uh, in a location where you don't have permission to because it doesn't exist at all. Like you write somewhere, but you forgot to allocate memory. That's a sec fault. And so the kernel in that case say, OK, you try to write somewhere you didn't have permission, and that place doesn't exist, sec fault for you. However, oh, you try to write in a location which is a ghost page, which is a copy of somewhere in the memory. OK, in that case, I'm going to make an actual copy just for your private personal use. And that's it. You can write on it, and everything is fine. So that's how copy and write works. It also exists for disks, which is great when you want to do snapshots of something. Like you have a database, it's running, and you're doing financial transactions. Like uh, I'm going to uh, get some money here and put it here. And at the same time, I want to do a backup of this database. And I want to make that on the low level, on the disk level. Uh, without copy and write, the, the thing is that disks are slow. So I could start to make my backup. And then, OK, I take the money here. Um, so in the backup, I still have the old version of the bank account. And then I put the money here, and then I take the backup here. Result, in my backup, I have the old bank account here, the new bank account here. So I just created money, economical problem solved, um, <laughs> but also a little banking problem. So you need consistency. And a good way to have that, uh, not the best, but one of the ways, is to use snapshots, which is suddenly I take all this storage space, I make a copy and write version of it, and now my backup is going to take a snapshot of that copy and write version so that when I write here, my backup still do is stuff on the copy and write version. But on top of it, the actual database runs on uh, those copied pages. So in my backup, I will still have the version of the database at the moment when I started the backup. And at the same time, the database continues to work. OK. So that became super important for cloud, because let's assume that I am a web hosting provider. I have thousands of VMs. And as it happens, 90% of my customers all run WordPress. <laughs> and so they all end up following the same tutorial. They, they take like the Debian image, and then install Apache and PHP and MySQL, and then they download WordPress, and they run it. So I end up with thousands of VMs with exactly the same thing. That's a big waste. Instead, I could make an original install of this. And when my customers pick their install, instead of uh, picking between Debian and Fedora and Ubuntu and CentOS and whatnot, they have WordPress, which is like my install of WordPress. So they pick that. First, it's easier for them. Great. And also, it means that I end up with uh, those 90 person customers that use WordPress. They end up using exactly the same disk space with Apache, MySQL, uh, and everything pre-installed. And only when they make changes to that, then they start to use more disk space. So if the typical server is 10 gigs, instead of uh, needing 1,000 times 10 gigs because I have 1,000 servers, I only need one times 10 gigs. Plus, as people will start to actually write data in their MySQL database and files in their WordPress instance, then they will start to use more disk space. And so I make huge economies and more profit than great. OK. So uh, as it happens, uh, copy and write used to be something uh, implemented only in big storage systems. Think NetApps, like a big 
stuff full of disks, very expensive. Um, but um, recently, over the last five, ten years, it started to become available on desktop systems. Uh, so there is LVM on Linux, ZFS on Solaris, and then also BSD on Linux, BitRFS, AUFS, and so on and so on and so on. And um, that was extremely important for Docker. Uh, without copy on write, when I do Docker run blah blah blah, I would end up making a full copy of blah blah blah, and that would be slow, and nobody would have been really excited about Docker, and we wouldn't be talking about Docker today because nobody would have ever used it. Thanks to copy on write, creating containers can be super easy. Creating tens, hundreds, thousands of containers on the same machine can be super, super easy. OK, uh, this is like a thank you slides for the people, like the super awesome, uh, amazing people that have created those copy and write systems. I probably forgot some of them, but still, thank you. And now I can start talking about Docker storage drivers. So where does that fit in? At first, uh, when we released Docker, uh, we only had support for one specific copy and write system called AUFS. That was because that's what we were using in .cloud, and we were pretty happy about it. Um, and we had a lot of experience with it, and so, say, yeah, this stuff works, and it's great. We have been running hundreds of containers on a single machine with it. Yeah problem is that AUFS is not in the mainline kernel. If you go to ftp.kernel.org and you get the source tree and you compile, there is no AUFS. So you have manual patches that you have to download and apply on top of that. We will also apply other security patches and some cluster patches and everything. So maintaining the .cloud kernel was complicated. <clears throat> but still, AUFS worked. Uh, we were using it. It was great. Uh, Debian and Ubuntu were using it for live CDs. You probably know those live CDs where you take like a CD or a USB key, you put it in your computer, and boom, it boots on Linux. It doesn't touch your hard disk. It doesn't change your data. It doesn't write anything on disk. But still, you can edit documents. You can install packages. It works with copy and write. <laughs> Everything is read from the CD or the USB key, but when you want to write, instead of writing on the CD, which is not possible because it's a CD, it will write in memory or in some little partition somewhere. Copy and write. So since Debian and Ubuntu had AUFS, we decided to say, OK, let's have Docker on top of AUFS, and it works, and everybody is happy. Everybody except people who don't have AUFS because they don't run Debian and Ubuntu kernels. That means all the folks using the Red Hat distros, Fedora, CentOS, RHEL, and they started to get uh, pitchforks and torches, and they went to their salesperson and they say, we want Docker, we want Docker. So those person in turn came to us and say, hey, how can we make Docker happen on Fedora and CentOS? CentOS and RHEL. Um, that's going to be complicated. Get AUFS merged in the kernel, maybe? They say, uh, no, it, it looks like the kernel maintainers don't want AUFS in the kernel. But maybe instead, we could use other copy and write systems. And so Red Hat contributed the support for Device Mapper, which is another copy and write system, then BetterFS, and then more recently, OverlayFS. So special thanks to those two guys from Red Hat, Alexander Larson and Vincent Batts, who kind of uh, initiated this whole thing, not only writing the drivers, but also writing all the kind of plugin E interface so that you can easily replace AUFS with Device Mapper or BetterFS and so on and so on. That without them, um, only the look if you running Ubuntu and Debian would be running Docker today. OK, let's now compare those different storage drivers, see their pros and cons. AUFS, so that's the legacy one. The idea with the UFS is that you have a bunch of directories and you, we call them branches or, or layers, and you mount them together. So now what happens is that when you try to read a file, or rather when you try to open a file, uh, AUFS will look on the first layer, is the file here? Nope. Second layer, is the file here? Nope. And so on and so on and so on. Two things can happen. Either you don't find the file and you say, file not found, or you find the file and then you open it on that layer. That's when you attempt to open for reads. If you try to open for writes, three scenarios. Either you don't find the file at all and then you create it on the top layer, or you find it uh, somewhere in the middle. And then you make a copy. We call that a copy up because we copy that file on top. Because all that layers are read only. Only the one on top is read write. So when you find the file somewhere in the middle, you copy it on top and because that's where you can write it. Which means that when you um, open uh, a file, if it's a big file, and if it's the, the read-only part, then it will take some time, because before even being able to do anything, uh, you have to wait for the files to be copied on top. 
Um, and there is a special case when you delete a file, then we place a special file um, called a, a whiteout, uh, which is like a, you know the little white stuff you put when you want to erase something on paper. Um, and so it means there used to be a file here, but it is no more. So when you try to open a file, if there is a whiteout, it says, no, nope, there is no file, because it's here to hide the fact that under, in another layer, there might be a file. OK, I will skip the practical details. Um, and so what's the problem? Well, ups and downs of AUFS. Ups, uh, it's kind of the legacy thing. So it's been kind of battle tested. Uh, we at Docker have been using it for years. So we know that it kind of works. Uh, it's also very memory efficient. If you start 1,000 containers using the same image, uh, it will only use one time the memory uh, for the page cache. So that's great. Downside is, as I said, if you open a big file in the read-only layers, uh, then it will take a while to uh, copy that file on top. And also, there is something that I call the stat explosion, which is if you have like a huge, let's say, Python path with 100 directories because you installed lots of packages and you have tons of layers, then each time you do import something, then it will look for uh, something.py and something.pyc and something.pyo uh, in uh, the, all the directories of the Python path. And for each directory of the Python path, we look in the first layer, second layer, third layer, fourth layer, and so on and so on and so on. So each time you try to do import something, if that something doesn't exist, worst case scenario, we will do 100 times 100 times 3, so 30,000 stat system calls. That's bad, that's slow. So that's why in some cases people are like, hey, UFS is slow with uh, Python or Ruby or Java if I have a huge uh, Python path, Ruby something path, or a Java class path. Next, device mapper. Device mapper is actually a very complex subsystem that can do read, encryption, that can uh, simulate latency and things like that. Um, in the context of Docker, when we say device mapper, it means one specific subsystem in device mapper, the thin provisioning target, which is something allowing to do arbitrary snapshot of disks. So in that case, the copy and write happens no longer on the file level, but on the block level, which means that um, uh, device mapper sits on the very bottom of the stack. Above, you have code like a ext4, so the stuff that when you do open slash home slash jerome slash profile, uh, it will translate that to a location somewhere on disk where there is the content of that file. Well, um, that translation happens, and then it maps to a disk, uh, to a block on disk, sorry, and that's where device mapper does its copy and write magic. So when I try to write a block here, that's when device mapper says, wait, that's block number uh, 12,056. It's actually read-only because it's part of a copy and write story, so I'm going to make an actual copy of that block so that this container can have its own private copy of it while everybody else is still looking at the central copy. So um, ups and downs of uh, the device mapper system is that, so the upside is that each container gets its own virtual disk. So if you want to move between VMs and containers, that's a little bit easier. Uh, it also, it's also better if you want to limit the disk space used by a container because it has a virtual disk. So when that disk is full, it can go beyond. Uh, the downside is that by default, Device Mapper is using uh, two big files, uh, data and metadata, uh, to store the blocks. And by default, those files are using sparse files. And sparse files are also a kind of, not exactly copy and write, but kind of a lazy allocation mechanism, which is basically what happens is that the first time you try to write on a file in a container using the copy and write system, it ends up to, OK, you're trying to write to block number 1,000. OK, uh, actually, I have to make a copy on that block. And now, OK, I will write here. Oh, it's in a sparse file. Uh, to write in a sparse file, I actually have to allocate a real disk block from somewhere. So I'm, again, instead of writing directly, I'm going to go somewhere in the disk pool and find some free blocks, which is why, by default, when you run Docker on Device Mapper, it's extremely slow. Uh, yeah, performance problem. You can tune that. The, the keyword to remember it's storage opt. Uh, you just Google that and you will find the documentation about how to make Docker not slow if you're using Device Mapper. Okay, 
BetterFS. BetterFS is something kind of in between uh, because the snapshot happens on the file system level. So BetterFS is super smart. You can say, okay, this is this directory is now a subvolume. It's something that I will be able to make snapshots of. When you make a snapshot of a subvolume, it's exactly as if you were making a full copy of a directory. Imagine you're working on some code and you say, hey, I'm going to break all the things. Uh, imagine you don't know about version control. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so you could make a copy of that directory, but with BetterFS, you could do a snapshot, which will be instant, even if your code is like five gigs, okay? And, and then uh, instantly you can work on it, and the original doesn't change. That sounds stupid with code, but now if you are talking about like a big geographic database with 60 gigs of data, suddenly it becomes very interesting. So in practice, um, with Docker, uh, well, that a few comments. Uh, there are some shortcomings with BetterFS, but I won't have the time to discuss them, unfortunately. Um, but uh, after, I will be down there, and I will be able to tell you more about the horrible things that BetterFS does to your disks. Now, OverlayFS. OverlayFS is just like a UFS, except it's in the kernel, so, well, uh, in the recent kernel, so after 3.18. So it means that everybody will be able to get the advantages of AUFS, the fact that uh, you can uh, start many copies and be uh, memory efficient, um, and even with recent kernels, not only with the Debian Ubuntu ones. Uh, okay. Um, VFS, last but not least, VFS is not really copy on write. It's copy on copy. <laughs> when you use the VFS driver and you do Docker run Python, you're making a full copy of the Python image. So what's the point? The point is where you have to work with some old grumpy sysadmins who are like, I don't want your fancy copy and write file system on my thing. It breaks all the time. That's not supported code. We already did that before, so go away. In that case, if you have some like mission critical stuff and running on very old kernels and you don't want to take risks, you can use VFS because it will just use plain copies. So each time you start a container, it will make a copy. Inefficient, slow, uh, it uses tons of memory and space and whatever, but at least it doesn't use risky code. And also, if you're porting Docker to another platform like Solaris or BSD, it will work because it's not relying on anything Linux specific. Okay, the conclusion is that generally people ask, hey, what's the storage driver that I should use for my setup? Because the nice thing with storage drivers is like standards that you have so many to choose from. Well, the bottom line is that um, if you're doing platform as a service or something where you need high density, use a UFS if it's available in your system or use overlay FS because those are memory efficient. If you want to have big files and write on them and they're in the read-only layer or whatever, like you have this big geographic database, for instance. Uh, it is some stuff with OpenStreetMap data, and it's great because you can have your whole uh, data set, and you can make experiments of it on it without having to make a full copy each time. Then you can use better FS or device mapper. So if really you want to tell me which one to pick, I would tell you, pick the one that you know best. If you have some, exper so some experience already with device mapper because you've done some stuff with LVM, then use device mapper. If you have some experience with better FS because you already used it on some of your systems and you kind of know the, how to drive it, then use better FS. Um, otherwise, just try them out and benchmark them and see what works best for your specific workload, as always. Uh, okay, that's it. I will now take a few questions. <laughs> <laughs>